precision delivery of medicine. Entertainment franchise games absolutely exploding. Small modular reactors and the nuclear renaissance, plus AI moving into very complex workflows. Now, these were just a few of the major tech innovations that partners at A16Z predicted last year. And our partners are back, and we just dropped our list of over 40 plus big ideas for 2024, a compilation of critical advancements across all our verticals, from smart energy grids to crime detecting computer vision, to democratizing miracle drugs like GLP-1s, or even AI moving from black box to clear box. You can find the full list of 40 plus builder worthy pursuits at a16z.com slash big ideas 2024 or you can click the link in our description below. But on deck today, you will hear directly from one of our partners as we dive even more deeply into their big idea. What's the why now? What opportunities and what challenges are on the horizon? And how can you get involved? Let's dive in. As a reminder, content here is for informational purposes only. Should not be taken as legal, business, tax, or investment advice, or be used to evaluate any investment or security and is not directed at any investors or potential investors in any A16Z fund. Please note that A16Z and its affiliates may also maintain investments in the companies discussed in this podcast. For more details, including a link to our investments, please see a16z.com slash disclosures. Hi, I'm Anisha Charya. I'm a GP on our consumer investing team looking at all things AI apps. Um, my big idea for this year is that voice will actually be a new sort of emerging way to interact with technology and at the heart of a new set of productivity apps. So the theory here is that, you know, voice is the way that humans have communicated with each other since, you know, really the day that communication was born. But voice has never really worked as an interface for technology. And I think one of the reasons for that is that when you interact with uh, a product using voice, you sort of have the unconscious expectations that you have would have of a human. So you expect it to actually be pretty flexible, cognitively sophisticated, and really be able to interact with you. And most of the systems that exist today, or at least have historically existed, are very inflexible. You know, there's just these sort of like logic trees, and if you don't navigate them perfectly, then they just don't work. And we've all experienced that with you know Alexa and some of the past generation voice assistants. So I think the, the go forward idea is that AI and large models really unlock humans' ability to interact with technology. I think the other thing that's very interesting for productivity apps is that, you know, you could imagine some of the incumbent productivity providers, you know, Gmail for email, for example, they're going to build a lot of the obvious features, uh, AI features for those apps and experiences, but it's less obvious that they would prioritize something that's voice first because it requires you rethinking the entire experience from the ground up. So I really think this it's an interesting area because it has previously never worked and now this technology allows it to work and it's not something the incumbents are obviously going to build. So that's uh, what I expect to see, hope to see and invest in in 2024. All right. So Anish, I feel like that sounds really exciting, but voice has been pending for quite some time. You addressed this a little bit, but I actually went back. I looked up the Gartner hype cycle over the last decade. Speech recognition popped up in 2010, and that was actually in the plateau of productivity. And yet, despite a lot of investment from a lot of big companies, we're talking Amazon, Google, Apple, feels like we're still waiting. And you addressed that maybe there's some new technology on the horizon, but what would you say has been the limiting factor thus far? I mean, it's simply that the old technology architecture doesn't allow you to get to the level of fidelity that you need. So if you look at it, kind of the last 10% is where 99% of the effort goes. And this is true of a lot of um, AI problems that were built on the old architecture. So, you know, self-driving is a great example of this sort of true interactive voice is a great example of this. You can get to 90%, you just can't get to 99%. And this new technology really lets you get to 99%. And you can see that if you've interacted with chat GPT via voice, it's very compelling. If you used 11 labs, I mean, their work is very compelling. So it's clear that this now works. And really what we needed was a technology shift, not a sort of set of like financial resources that incumbents have historically provided to make this work. Yeah. And you mentioned that existing apps aren't necessarily equipped to build these experiences. Maybe you could just elaborate on that and maybe also think through like what would a voice first app even look like? Yeah, that, that's a great question. So first, you know, existing apps are built with a set of existing workflows. 
And anytime you modify the workflow, you have to think about how that affects all of the existing users. This is why, you know, I'm sure there's a lot of creative people at Gmail, but it's very hard for them to go to a dramatically different paradigm like a superhuman. And of course, Google tried this with Inbox and ended up shutting it down. But, you know, there's a mm -hmm. set of consumer expectations and a huge audience that just expects a product to work a certain way. And to do something like a voice first inbox, for example, you're just going to need a completely different set of workflows. So if Google does decide to do that, they're going to have to start from scratch along with everyone else. Um, so it, it's not obvious to me that an incumbent will build this. Um, in terms of what the experience would look like, you know, a great example is a lot of executives that I know when they're driving into work in the morning, they'll phone uh, their executive assistant and they'll say, hey, let's go through my inbox together. Let's talk about what seems like it's a priority, what seems like it's important but not urgent, what's clearly spam, what are internal versus external asks. And they will together sort of prioritize so that when that executive arrives, they're sort of ready to go with everything they need to do. So an experience like that, I think, would make enormous sense, except now it's available to everyone, not just executives who have a dedicated assistant. Yeah, definitely. And you mentioned two specific areas that you're looking to in 2024, including companionship and productivity. Here's to know what you're already seeing built there. Like, are you already seeing builders create apps that are live and working and are voice first? Tell us a little bit more about what you're seeing there. Yeah, there's a lot of cool exploration that's happening in the voice space. So one of the ones that I'm the biggest fan of is a product called Tab. So Tab has gotten a bunch of heat online and it's a, it's a very interesting founder and a very interesting product idea where it's a pendant that you wear that sort of passively captures your conversations throughout the day. And then it allows you to interact with all of that context, ask questions, ask it to summarize. So it's a great example of someone who's really thinking about this from a first principles perspective, a voice first perspective. I think the second most interesting product, you know, outside of something like 11 is actually just chat GPT's voice module mm -hmm. and their voice sort of interface. So I, I guess I encourage everyone to go take a walk and just have a chat with chat GPT. And you'll be amazed at how quickly you sort of forget that you're talking to an AI and you yeah. fall into the flow of a conversation. So I'd say between tab, chat GPT, and certainly what the team at 11 is doing, there's a lot of cool stuff to check out. Yeah. And as this tech gets better, I think what I'd love to hear your perspective on is really like the unlikely or maybe unexpected is the better word uh, type of experiences that right now don't seem obvious. But I mean, I think it's easy for people to imagine, oh, yeah, I can send an email. Oh, yeah, I can start a song with my Alexa. But if we're really talking something foundational where voice becomes the the primary potential modality for interacting with some of these applications. Can you just like think through like what are the different contexts or like what might we imagine to be on the horizon that's a little more significant than what we imagine with voice today? I mean, it's it's trite to cite this, but I will anyway, which is simply the movie Her. Like that's yeah. it, you know, <laughs> which is a passive sort of experience that has all the context that you have where voice is the primary modality of interaction and then you can fall back to a screen if and when needed. So I, I like if we look back in 10 years and that's the way that we interact with technology, it, it won't feel like such a leap. Yeah. Well, I mean, I think the important question then is that currently is not the primary modality. And so you have all of these companies who really rely on a website or an app or a graphical user interface, which may become moot if, if we really are moving in that direction. I mean, curious to know your perspective there on how builders should be thinking about that potential paradigm if it really is voice first. Like how do, how do existing companies integrate this thoughtfully? I don't know if it is moot. I think that there's room for both. Like there's a lot more ten technology penetration to be had. So if you're a developer and you work in an IDE, you're probably faster hands on keyboard with screen than you're going to be with voice, mm -hmm. um, at least for now. And, and maybe the answer is some you know combination of the two. So I actually, I think that there is a lot of room for existing products and existing sort of modalities for interaction. On the other hand, if you're maybe a senior citizen, you know, you simply, I mean, maybe you're interacting with technology, but you're really struggling with it. And this unlocks every product for you potentially. So yeah. I think it's a market expansion, positive sum story, not a zero sum story. Mm -hmm. But I tend to always think that. So, yeah, no, I agree. I think it's positive sum. But how would you, for example, if you're an application that does not have a voice first interaction mode, should all builders be thinking about that incorporation? Or, or how would you think about that if you're an existing builder 
without this on your roadmap? I think the customer and the sort of interaction pattern is so different that if I had an existing product, I would probably focus on, you know, playing from my place of advantage, which is non-voice workflows, rather than trying to rethink my product from the ground up around this. And look, there may be, uh, the answer may be in the middle where there actually are some workflows that are voice enabled that extend the existing workflow. Um, but again, I think this is a sort of like a market expansion, net new yeah. customer story rather than someone taking existing. Yeah. And if founders are thinking about creating in this new environment, are there any challenges you'd call out um, from your experience with some of these tools like Eleven Labs in terms of just um, maybe where we are in this arc and what can and can't be done? Look, I think you have to retrain people. Uh, they need to know how to interact with these systems. And by default, their expectations are going to be very high. It's going to be like, look, I should be able to interact with this in the exact, with the same level of fidelity and responsiveness and sort of flexibility that I can with a human. Mm-hmm. Um, so if that's not what you're able to offer or what you intend to offer, then it will require sort of training your customer to interact with you in the right way. So I do think that there's an onboarding question. And then look, I think there's also a just sort of a social patterns question where, you know, is it going to be socially acceptable to be sort of talking into thin air? Now, arguably people are already doing that with their sort of Bluetooth (laughs) and AirPods. And so, you know, maybe we'll all change quickly together as a society, but I think there'll be some period of time for which, you know, the the early adopters are going to feel a little crazy or that they look that way. You know, it's so funny you mentioned that. My husband's grandmother said the first time she ever heard someone talking on a cell phone, she thought they were crazy because they were doing it in the supermarket. And she was like, why are they talking to themselves? So maybe, you know, there's an element of that uh, now again. Um, To round things out, seems like there's a lot of opportunity on the table. We're talking about a potential change in an interaction modality. If you were an entrepreneur, how would you even think about starting? What would you look at? Yeah, tell me a little bit more uh, about where you would begin. I, I mean, it's uh, obviously it's tautological that you can only begin at the beginning. Like, I think it's impossible to uh, infer what the end product is going to look like, and you've just got to start building. So, I, you know, I think I would try to build something useful and interesting, and uh, and, and just iterate from there. That's it. Look, I, I think the other um, thing that's interesting here is that with some of these technologies, if you're too pointed at the beginning in terms of product design, then it can constrain you. I think that if you introduce the capability in an intelligent way, your customers will pull you in a direction. I think some mm-hmm. of the best product builders I've seen have been willing to you know, try to offer the capability in a way that is relatively neutral and allow the customer set to pull them. Yeah, and per your advice earlier, for people to play around with this tech themselves and to use voice more. 100%, always, just use the products, just use the products. All right, I hope you enjoyed this big idea. We do have a lot more on the way, including programmable medicine that's taking a page out of the reusable rocket playbook, anime going mainstream, and whether the consumer AI battleground may be moving from model to UX. Plus, if you want to see our full list of 40 plus big ideas right now, you can head on over to a16z.com slash big ideas 2024. It's time to build.